All right, ready? Did anyone watch those yes. videos? Yes. You, what'd you watch? What video you watch? Oh, you did? Well, that's good. I watched like in the shark. Okay. All right. What the hell is this? Okay. The, they said the audio on that uh, hamburger one was bad. Is it? No. Oh, then somebody's got a jacked up computer then. It was fine for me. All right, hang on. Here we go. Anaphylactic shock. I want this whole thing. Ready? Okay. To get anaphylactic shock, the allergen that you're allergic to, the substance that you're allergic to, has to be injected or ingested, right? And what it means is it has to enter the blood and it has to circulate throughout the blood. Tell me you got that. So, here we go. And I want all of this. Boom. That's a B. You like that? Okay, wait. And if a B stings you, ouch. Where are they going to inject that B venom? Everywhere. Well, look. Look what the tip of the needle is. <laughs> it's in the blood. So now you have BV, B venom in your blood. Tell me you got that. This is the important thing. On your first exposure, do you have sensitized B cells already? No. no. So on your first exposure, when you first got stung by a bee, you may in fact not know that you're allergic to it. But on your second exposure, what do you have lying in wait for that bee venom? You have memory B cells. So when that bee venom gets into the blood, you're going to have B cells circulating, those memory B cells. They're going to match up receptors with that B venom. Who's with me so far? And when that B venom comes in contact with the receptor of a memory B cell that's specific for this B venom, it divides into plasma cells and memory cells, right? And the plasma cells then begin to secrete antibodies into the blood. Are you following? Now this is the normal immune response. But in people with allergies, and now because of anaphylaxis, the antibodies that are produced by the plasma B cells, oh, I just erased that vein. Different color. The antibodies that are produced, they get bound to these things called mast cells. And this ain't writing. Come on, you pork. Maybe the maybe that's out of color. Uh oh. Now watch. Maybe this there we go. Oops. Hang on. Ah, uh, shit. You know what? And I'm not even... Hang on. It's going to irritate me.
Okay. Watch. I'll just make a big version here. Alright, so this is what you got. You got a blood. You got bee venom. Right? You got a bee cell. Memory bee cell. Comes in contact with that bee venom. You got me? This is a memory bee cell. And when it comes in contact with it, it's going to divide into plasma B cells and then memory B cells again. So you maintain that memory. The plasma B cells produce antibodies that will attack the B venom. Where's the B venom? Everywhere. And I'm telling you, you need to get this. And if you don't, it's going to be bad for you. But in people with allergies, there's an additional step. And that step is, is that antibodies get bound to mast cells. And what do mast cells contain? Histamine. So this is the important piece. When the antibody circulates to find the antigen, and the antigen is everywhere, when that antibody attacks it, the mast cell releases histamine. What does histamine do? It causes massive arterial vasodilation. Where? Everywhere. So, according to Ob's flow law, Q equals systolic. You got me? And with the massive release of histamines, it's going to cause massive arterial vasodilation everywhere. So resistance to blood flow will drop everywhere. And that will drop your systolic blood pressure. And if you don't have a mean arterial blood pressure of at least 60, you are in shock. What caused the shock? A total body allergic reaction. And by definition, that's anaphylaxis. So you are in anaphylactic shock. What's the treatment for anaphylactic shock? epinephrine because epinephrine causes massive arterial vasoconstriction where everywhere and it's also a bronchodilator and I made this a point when I talked to you about the lining of the respiratory tract I explained to you that it's very vascular so when you get that histamine release all over all of the blood vessels in your resp upper respiratory tract and lower are going to dilate so that is going to decrease the airway, right? The diameter of the airway. So people will wheeze, and the most common complaint is, it felt like my throat was closing off. That's because it is closing off. And the treatment is epinephrine, right? What's the subsequent treatment? Like after? After. No. You give them epinephrine. You give them steroids to suppress the immune system and you want to prevent the mast cells from releasing more histamines, so you give them antihistamines. Say yes. See how beautiful that is? How many people like that? Yep, that's my favorite. Okay. That's anaphylactic shock. An allergy is simply a localized reaction just like that only it's localized it does not produce a total body allergic reaction and if you don't t say to me on the final that it, you have to be injected or ingested well your whole life gets marked from yeah do you want that not at this stage did i go over blood clotting well we are behind I'm going to go over blood clotting, and then I'm going to go over the blood types. You got me? This is the blood clotting cascade. If you notice, factor 9 is called Christmas factor. Aw. <laughs> All right, here we go. I made an error.
All right. This is what I want to explain to you. Are there times that you want your blood to clot when when you're what? Right, when you're bleeding your own blood, right? So in times of injury to a blood vessel, and I'll show you in a little bit, you want your blood to clot. This is what I want you to understand. There are three arms, right? Three pathways to the coagulation of blood. You have the intrinsic pathway, you have the extrinsic pathway, and then you have the common pathway. You got me? This is the most important part. When you damage a vessel, both the intrinsic and extrinsic pathway are activated at the same time. Okay, now let me ask you a question. All right, let me ask you a question. If, which would be easier to do? To change your transmission or change your oil? Why? It doesn't have your transmission. Like the whole car? <laughs> you need the transmission? The reason it's easier is because there are fewer steps. In a process that requires fewer steps, it's quicker. Are you writing this down? Tamara, are you writing it down? You're just taking it all in, aren't you? You go, girl. You got that 50 extra credit points with that. I don't know how you figured that out. That's impressive. Anyways, here we go. Watch. Watch. Let me erase some of this stuff. Watch. The most important process when you form a clot is converting this inactive fibrinogen into the active fibrin. Do you got me? Now watch. The our extrinsic pathway only has a few steps to get from inactive fibrinogen to fibrin. Are you with me? But the problem with the extrinsic pathway is it doesn't create a stable clot. It stops the bleeding temporarily. The intrinsic pathway, as you can see, has many more steps. So it will create more front, uh, fibrin as a result and form a stable clot. Hence the need for two pathways. Do you understand that? Now, and this is what I want you to understand about the, these blood clotting factors. They are all enzymes. And what do enzymes do? They make chemical reactions happen quicker, right? So watch. You have factor 11. Wait, this is factor 12, right? Roman numerals. And I'll explain in a minute. It's inactive unless it is exposed to a chemical. When that chemical is, comes in contact with factor 12, it becomes the active factor 12. Who's following this? And it is an enzyme that then will activate factor 11. And watch, watch. Factor 12, when it's activated, just doesn't turn on one factor 11. It turns on 10 factor 11s. And when you turn on 10 factor 11s, it doesn't turn on 10 factor 9s. It turns on 1,000 factor 9s. So there's a multiplication. It's exponential. So the greater number of steps, the greater activation the number of enzymes, and ultimately the greater conversion of fibrinogen to fibrin. Do you follow that? Yes or no? All right, here we go. I want this whole thing.
What's that? Yeah, that's good. Is there a video on this? Yeah. Did you watch it? Yeah. Well, you, what do you so you think you're better than everybody else? No. Well, maybe you are. Okay, hang on. I did that. They said the audio didn't work on this either. Does the audio work on that? Yeah. What a bunch of liars! I knew who it was too. You know what I'm gonna do when I see her? Tripper. Watch. If somebody doesn't like you, and it's hard to believe that someone didn't like you, and they took a broom handle and stabbed it into you, and then they pulled it out and went on to their next victim, you have damaged a vessel. Please get this. When you damage a vessel, the tissue within that vessel releases a chemical called tissue factor. When's the only time tissue factor is released? When you damage a blood vessel. Tell me you got that. So in this case, now what you've done is you've created a couple paths for blood. Just so you know, bleeding is good for you. How many people like to bleed? You ever have a weekend where you just bleed? Good. Oh, yeah, that's right. I forget who my audience is. <laughs> All right. Yep. Okay. Well, we'll leave that one alone. All right, so watch. Watch. Remember I told you that in arterial blood, that blood flows in a laminar fashion, right? The, the watery part of blood flows on the edges and the formed elements flow in the middle. Say yes. So as you begin to bleed your own blood out of this hole that was created by that broom handle, you have formed elements in your blood. One of the formed elements in your blood are platelets. And platelets, when they're inactive, are round. But when platelets come in contact with tissue factor, they turn into stars. And they get attitudes, and they're on magazine covers. And they truly do believe they're better than everybody else. Now watch. When these inactive platelets come in contact with tissue factor, why did they come in contact with tissue factor? The blood vessel was damaged. The platelets inactive are round. The active platelets are star-shaped. And the stars begin to align. I hate me too. The star tips of these active platelets will begin to connect together and they will form a platelet plug. So the first process in forming a blood clot is to activate platelets and form an initial platelet plug. Are you following me? When the platelet plug is formed, the platelets themselves begin to release tissue factor. And the tissue factor will then begin to activate the inactive enzymes that were floating in the blood. And now that they're active, that cascade of chemical reactions is going to occur with the ultimate chemical reaction of taking fibrinogen to fibrin. Tell me you got that. The common pathway is important. Prothrombin is an enzyme that is inactive, and it is activated by factor 10 to the active enzyme thrombin. Thrombin converts the inactive fibrinogen to fibrin, and basically what fibrin does is it forms a protein network that interlaces the platelets. So it forms a protein net that will catch red blood cells. And as it catches the red blood cells, red blood cells that don't move agglutinate, they clump together. That's what forms that gooey thing. 
Tell me you got that. And you want that to form as quickly as possible. So the extrinsic pathway is activated quickly, but it doesn't form a lot of fibrin. But it forms enough fibrin to slow the process of bleeding. Then you activate at the same time the intrinsic pathway, and that intrinsic pathway forms the stable clot so you don't bleed it to death. It. Say yes. You followed this. Now watch. Are there times when you want your blood to clot slower? Yeah. Name those times. When you're going to have a heart attack. How about when you're going to have a baby? I'm a woman in love and I love... <laughs> You're all haters. Yeah. You think you want this over? You know what I'm going to do? When this is all over, I'm going to smoke me some K2. And bleed to death. <laughs> you know why? Because it interferes with your clotting factors. See how this all relates? Don't hate. Here we go. All right. So watch. There are times when you want your blood to clot slower. One of them is when you're having an MI. You don't want to form that clot in that vessel. Say yes, right? How about a stroke, right? With this class, you probably will end up having a stroke, right? For the final, I'll see a bunch of with facial droops and drooling. Anaphylaxis, Tim. Here's one. Atrial fibrillation. If the atria don't contract, the, you don't get that atrial kick, so blood will pool in the atria, and blood that pools clots. How about an artificial valve? Right? Anyone who has an artificial valve or even a pig valve, right, they are put on anticoagulants. How about a DVT? Say yes, TV. Yeah. yeah. So all of these people require some type of anticoagulant therapy. Is there a time when a person's in an hospital who doesn't have these require anticoagulant therapy? Yeah. When? After surgery. after surgery. Because you don't want to pop a lock after you have surgery, right? But venous blood that doesn't move, what? Wow. So to reduce the chances of developing deep vein thrombosis, they will give you an anticoagulant. What can you not do right after you have surgery? Eat. You can't eat. So that's why heparin or its derivative is given. And it's given subcutaneously. Why isn't it given intramuscularly? How many people have had a, like a prime rib? You ever had prime rib? Do me a favor, I, I can't get students. <laughs> if you have like a nice steak, and who would take a steak and then cook it and make it well done? Who would do that? It's like making bacon, right? Why do people like crispy bacon? I love So watch, if you eat a muscle, right, if you ever see a steak, it's glistening with blood, right? There's a huge blood supply. What does heparin do? It prevents your blood oh, yeah, from clotting, yeah, yeah. right? So if you stick it in a muscle, you're going to cause bleeding, and because you just gave them heparin, you won't be able to stop the bleeding. So you'll end up with a giant puddle of blood in your arm. There's not a lot of blood vessels and fat. That's why they give itself cutaneously. There's reasons for everything. Tell me you got that. First of all, heparin is not absorbed well from the GI tract. And heparin, is, so they give it sub-Q, and plus they can't eat anyways. Are you with me? So heparin, how it works, is it stimulates an enzyme called antithrombin. And it prevents prothrombin from being converted to thrombin. 
if you prevent that and there's less thrombin, will you produce as much inactive fibrinogen to fibrin? No. So you will have less fibrin and therefore the blood is like less likely to clot. I'm talking to myself, ain't I? Pretty much. Am I? Guys? Okay. So watch. So heparin works by, by stimulating that enzyme and preventing this reaction from happening. And really what it does, as you can see, it really attacks the intrinsic pathway for blood clotting. Now, and you better write this down because I want this in the answer. The test to look at the effectiveness of heparin is called the heparin test. It's called the partial thromboplastin time. And it's abbreviated PTT. Does anybody work in an hospital al al? Have you ever seen PTT? Yes? Okay. So this partial thromboplastin time measures the effectiveness of heparin. So initially after surgery, a doctor is going to ask for a partial thromboplastin time or PTT. Do doctors trust patients to inject medicine correctly? No, that's why doctors are reluctant to prescribe patients insulin because they're like, they'll screw it up. They can't even do simple math. Are you following? So when a patient is knowing that they're going to be going home at some point, what they will do is they will switch them to from heparin to Coumadin, right? Now, the reason they, they switch them from heparin to Coumadin is so you don't have to worry about people sticking their belly. And now, two or three days out, they're eating now. Their belly's working, right? Their GI tract's working, so they can take an oral um, anticoagulant. But this is the important thing. Coumadin, Coumadin, ooh, ooh, that's a good word. Coumadin, it takes about th two to three days of dosing with Coumadin before it will produce its anticoagulant effect. That's why patients in the hospital you will see them being on heparin and Coumadin, especially the last couple of days of their stay. So the Coumadin is really not taking effect, so they're using the heparin. Say yes. Coumadin's effect is different. Coumadin prevents the liver from recycling vitamin K. Vitamin K is an absolute cofactor. It's an absolute requirement to activate factor seven. If you don't have vitamin K, you can't activate um, factor seven, and therefore you can't turn on the extrinsic pathway. So Coumadin affects the extrinsic pathway, heparin the intrinsic pathway. Who's following this so far? You, sh you need to start paying attention to Hi, I'm Arnold Palmer, and when I'm not drinking Arnold Palmer's, right, I'm taking Eliquist, and I like Eliquist because you don't have those, all those dietary restrictions associated with that other anticoagulant. Now watch, and this is important to understand, and this is NCLEX 101. Coumadin only affects the vitamin K recycling in the liver. Remember that you store fat-soluble vitamins in your liver. One of them happens to be vitamin K. Do you understand this? But it doesn't affect if you take vitamin K in through your diet. That's why there are dietary restrictions associated with Coumadin. Green leafy vegetables are loaded with vitamin K. So that's why people who are on Coumadin, they have to have their blood tested frequently because they, if they're taking in vitamin K unknowingly through their diet, it will reduce the effect of Coumadin. 
and that can lead to all sorts of problems. Now, watch. The blood test for Coumadin is called the protime or PT. You got me? The blood test for heparin or Eliquist or Lovenox, Lovenox, you've heard of Lovenox, is the partial thromboplastin time. That's why you will see Lovenox and heparin. Right. Eliquist and Coumadin require a pro time. So watch. You will see a doctor, and they, they you'll see this. PTT, PT, and INR. Have you ever seen that? You've seen that? Do you know what that means? This is the uh, partial thromboplastin time for heparin. So they're measuring the effectiveness of heparin. This is measuring the effectiveness of Coumadin. And what's the INR? What does that mean? Watch. People who take Coumadin, they have to have their pro time checked frequently. As a matter of fact, a lot of people who are on Coumadin long term they actually have home monitoring pro time monitors, right? Does anyone here have a pro time monitor? You, if you get one, I'll give you extra credit and take Coumadin for no reason. Watch. Does Freighter Hospital use the same kit in their lab to measure pro time? as Lutheran General Hospital in Illinois. Do you think they do? Yeah. No, they don't. They use different kits. So a doctor wants to know that the pro time in Milwaukee is the same as the pro time in Chicago. Are you following this? So they came up what's called the International Normalization Ratio. And what that is, is they take the patient's pro time divided by the kit control pro time. Kit control. Don't that sound like an actor? Ephraim Zimbalist Jr. and kit control in Get Christy Love. Is anyone willing to change their name legally to kick control? No? All right, so watch. Do you want the patient's pro time to be higher or lower than the control? Do you want it to take longer for their blood to clot? No. They're on anticoagulant therapy. <laughs> <laughs> Yep. Boy, I'm making a difference, you know. God. You know who had it down? Scott Stieg. He taught chemistry in Kenosha. Oh, he was horrible. <laughs> no, he had the right idea. You know what he would do? Students would come to him and say, um, Scott, I don't understand this. And he goes, go to academic support. That's what they're there for. <laughs> That's what his office hours were. Go to academic support. That's what they're there for. He had it down, man. He was he was making a difference. Here we go. Um, we're talking about anticoagulant therapy. <laughs> so do you want the patient's pro time to be higher than the control? Do you want it to take longer for them to bleed? Jeez. Yes. So what you do is the patient's pro time, I'm making this up, was 30 seconds. And the kick control, you know what? I'm going to find me a woman and have a baby with her and name the baby kit control. 
the kick control pro time is 15 seconds. So the INR is what? Two. Yeah, I made the math so it wasn't too difficult. <laughs> the INR is 2.0. Tell me you got that. That's what the physician looks at. Bless you. And watch. Based on the type of condition that you have, that will determine how high the INR needs to be. Typically what they want for people with DVT prophylaxis to prevent DVT, they want the INR about 1.5. If you have uh, atrial fibrillation, they want it about 2. If you have a prosthetic valve, they want it at 2.5 or sometimes 3. Tell me if you're following this. So that is PT, PTT, and INR. Say yeah. Okay. I probably shouldn't even tell you this. Is there like a special like blood condition where you don't have factor seven? Uh, yeah. Is it? What does that mean? Your blood just doesn't clot, or? Yes. Uh, it. Um, some people have too much of it where their blood will um, clot prematurely. If you you ever heard of factor five? Well, it's the fifth factor. <laughs> factor five is where you produce too much factor five, and the result is, is that your blood has a tendency to clot. So they're at risk for deep vein thrombosis, pulmonary embolus, uh, the whole nine yards. So, so they'd be a long-term like anticoagulant. Yeah, usually what they do is just give them an aspirin to uh, prevent the platelets from sticking together to prevent that initial platelet plug. And that's what uh, they do. All right, now we got the circle of death. I think this computer is on its last legs anyways. I like the circle. The wheels of the bus go round and round. Okay. Right, it's almost over. This class always ends poorly anyways. I'm a starter, not a finisher. Right, Tamaya, it, it is officially over for that woman, right? She is just right. Too much air. <laughs> you probably got air in your blood, don't you? You figured that out and put air in your blood. Okay, watch, watch. <laughs> I'm gonna throw fuel on the fire now here. These pathways are not independent. Watch, if you activate this pathway, what stops it, right? If you activate it, what stops it? The answer is, is that when, you are when you're making a clot, at the same time, an enzyme called plasmin is busting down the clot. So what this does is it's kind of goofy. You build the clot, and then plasma comes in and breaks up the clot a little bit. That's why that clotting mechanism doesn't get out of control, and you wake up one morning, and you're one big blood clot. Do you follow? Now, there are times when blood clots form, and you want to break down that blood clot, right? But the amount of plasma that you have in the blood normally isn't that high it's because you shouldn't be forming blood clots in your vessels, right? So plasmin has to be converted to the active plasmin from the inactive plasminogen. You with me? So there's a drug out there that activates the inactive plasminogen into the active clot buster plasmin. And it's called tissue plasminogen activator, TPA. Have you ever heard of it? Yeah. It's a clot buster. And it activates the inactive plasminogen into the active plasmin, which dissolves clots. The problem with that is that that can get out of control because normally it's not activated. So it can be like a runaway train where now you're busting clots all over the place and the blood will not clot. So you end up bleeding to death. So this drug is given 
in very, very serious situations where the person really has no other choice or they're going to die. So that's given in heart attacks that are lethal, right, potentially lethal unless that blood gets flow reestablished, re or it's given in strokes where you're going to end up drooling out of the side of your mouth. So the risk is worth the reward. Is that why there's a time frame where you can give it? Absolutely. Right. So you have to, right. You have to do like 215 neural checks with that. Is that because of the stroke? Other it's because of the stroke or, and you don't want them to, oh. if they start bleeding in their skull, right, because you can't, you, you cause some bleeding, it'll end poorly for them. So this drug is very, very potent. And watch, when you're clotting, you're breaking down the clot. When you're breaking down the clot, you're not clotting. So what that means is, is that when you're breaking down a clot, you inhibit the clotting mechanism. So if you start bleeding, you will bleed to death. There you go. But well, you don't just, it's usually only used like, you know, It's like only in very, very life serious, life-threatening life situations life where if you don't do something heroic, that person is going to end up dead or uh, they're going to have a really bad stroke. Got me? Um, one more thing. Now watch. Watch. What does Coumadin affect? Vitamin K. Vitamin K. It prevents the liver from recycling it. So it basically decreases the amount of usable vitamin K in the blood. What's the treatment for Coumadin overdose? Vitamin K. <laughs> Vitamin K. Hey. What's the treatment for heparin? Yeah. Oh, uh, no. called protamine sulfate. You wouldn't know that. The only reason I brought that up is because it makes me feel good when I know something that you don't. So I'll leave here tonight feeling feeling better about myself. Okay, so, <laughs> all right. Tell me you followed that, right? I, again, this is what I want from you. When the clotting mechanism in, is initiated, the intrinsic and extrinsic pathway are both activated at the same time. The extrinsic pathway is quicker because there's less steps, but it only forms, it forms an unstable clot. The intrinsic pathway takes longer, but it forms a stable clot. And then you need to know the effects of heparin and Coumadin. Say yes. Rock on. This is what I need from you. I'm using the epic pen because this is an epic moment. I need from you one is you need to watch the um, blood type and RH factor. Got me? Um, blood clotting, that video's there, blood clotting, yeah, what's the other one? Um, RH incompatibility. Is there a video on that? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, nice. RH incompatibility. Got me? Oh, wait. Wait, it's one, two, three, three. You know, Ilya, I take that back about the math. I couldn't even count. One, two, three, three. We, this is a new math. Where are you going? We ain't done yet. Um, we're gonna have a well, we're I'm gonna have a quiz. Fully charged, okay. Get get some jagged edges there. 
I'm not going over this. Do you understand? You're going to watch these videos and you're going to go over it. And they're good videos too. The RH incompatibility, that's going up against the Black Panther on the Academy Award. <laughs> Can you imagine if that actually happened? See Timmy in a tux. I hope I win. <laughs> Then I'd say, I'd like to thank all the little people. Like Eric, who thought there was air in the blood. <laughs> he inspired me to make better videos. <laughs> Dude, you'll be 96 and I'll still be teaching, right? Yeah, I had a student, he thought there was air in the blood. Okay, four. <laughs> With a differential and uh, right and left shift. Say yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay, and then um, we're going to start the nervous system. This is going to help you. It's going to help you. Circulation of cerebral spinal fluid. Ready? And um, how a nerve generates an electrical impulse. If you could do that for me, for you. <laughs> if you do that, then on Monday uh, uh, we can rock and roll and get through some of this stuff so we will not be that uh, far behind. Can you do that, mm -hmm. guys? Yes. Can I give you a quiz on it? No. Definitely. Right, because then, then there's no accountability. What right, you don't have to watch. What kind of quiz? I can give you a multiple choice quiz worth 110% of your grade, 10% of your microbiology grade. Will you do that? Yes. I don't even know why I'm asking. Tim, is there videos on like the limb and the structure and functions and like the paper it's in, like, and the vaccine? Because I didn't watch it. It's in a certain video. It's in a certain video. Remember. If you look at the immune response yeah. and yeah, anaphylaxis. I watched that video, but it didn't really say anything about the vaccine or anything. Or lymph. Mm. It's in a video. I know it. I well, that doesn't mean really I know. I don't remember the video. I'll have to look at the... Yeah, you can on your own. Would it be under like the immune system? Videos? Yeah, if, I, I have a playlist, don't yeah, I? Yeah, yeah I look at okay. in the immune system. Oh, give me the multiple guess. Uh, put them right, yes, right where Tamaya put hers. What? I'm reminding you, on Wednesday at 5. I guess not. Wednesday okay. at 5. This Wednesday at 5? Next Wednesday? Mm -hmm. No. Okay. This Wednesday, it is Wednesday. Oh, jeez. Hey. Uh, you better, you, you, you need to email me, like, uh, Wednesday afternoon. Like to remind you? Yeah. What time? Like uh, one o'clock. One. Okay. Yeah. All right. I will. You better study. I know. <laughs> oh. And I'm never gonna see you guys again, so oh. you know. Tim, I'm not. See us. When? When we take micro. Yeah, we we'll take micro. We'll be in Racine. We'll be here every morning. Do you have class? Yep. Yeah. Meet yeah. us at like nine. Damn, like, my she's friend such a weirdo. <laughs> 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 She's such a weirdo. <laughs> we'll see you then in the summer. Yeah. Okay. All right. Bring me some Diamond Dew. Lily, you did good.